Joining us now is Oji Okpe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jenix. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Abadi. How was your weekend? It was excellent. Yeah. I missed your birthday. So I have to <laughs> sing for you. Can we all sing for Dr. Abadi? His yeah. birthday was yesterday. I'm very Happy shy. birthday, I'm birthday shy. to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Tundra Good morning, Twinning. We are twinning. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You look glorious. Good so morning, Rufai. Good morning, Aji. How are you? Looking glorious. Thank and you so Chinese much. is looking great as always. Dr. Oh. Bati, implication master. <laughs> I, I see to the implication. He is up to the task. <laughs> anyway, he started yesterday, so. I love it. I, I have Bati never is done. running a temperature right now, so <laughs> I think we need to move on. He's <laughs> He doesn't like me to put on the spot. Mm -hmm. well, congratulations, Dr. Abati. Thank you. Thank you and very much. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In the United States, Tesla billionaire Elon Musk over the weekend launched a Twitter poll of his 62.6 million followers asking if he should sell 10% of his shares. The vote, which is a response to a billionaire's tax proposed by the U.S. Democrats, could see Musk who owns more than $200 billion worth of Tesla shares, end up with a massive tax bill. In Yemen, Abdul Rayana al Britani, a British-born Islamic commander who boasted of his involvement in killing an anti-Muslim figure in the United Kingdom, was shot dead over the weekend. The 30-year-old, who was born into a conservative family, became radicalized in Britain after the invasion of Iraq and is reported to have recruited and trained several UK terrorists. He was killed while leading an assault on the village of Al Hamida. In Nigeria, supporters on Sunday gathered at the house of the candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, Charles Chukuma Soludo, singing praises after results declared by the Independent National Electoral Commission revealed that the former central bank governor was the lead candidate in the Anambra governorship election, winning 17 out of 19 local government areas already declared. Under sports, West Ham stunned Liverpool on Sunday as they secured a huge victory in the Premier League with a 3-2 win ending the Reds' 25-game unbeaten run. It was West Ham's first win against Liverpool since 2015. Finally, under entertainment, investigators are determining the cause of the tragedy that occurred in Houston when fans of musicians Travis Scott and Drake surged towards the stage at the Astro World Music Festival on November 5th, leaving eight people dead, including a 14-year-old and scores of others injured. On Sunday, Travis Scott took to Twitter to express shock and pledged support for the families of those affected. Oh, may their souls rest in peace. Let's begin what's trending in Nigeria with reactions trailing the Anambra governorship election and several glitches that occurred on November 6th, which led the polls to be declared inconclusive. Over the weekend, reports of vote buying and ballot box snatching circulated online. A supervisory presiding officer on Sunday was reported to have carted away 41 results sheets in the Indemili South local government area of the state, while a video that captured some women rejecting money allegedly given to them to vote for a political party went viral. Let's take a look before we come back for a discussion. <laughs> Well, I wasn't shocked when I saw this video. If you recall, on Friday, we did another video with another political party, which, you know, appeared to be the PDP, doing the same exact 
thing. But, you know, when I read that the APC was accusing um, the current governor of massive rip rigging of the election would put uh, Soludo right now in the lead. I was like appalled, you know, juxtaposing it with this video to drive your life. But I will stand it there. <laughs> well, everybody, this is the thing with the constant yeah. finger pointing that goes on around here. This, I thought, was actually really inspiring for me the people rejecting the money because the received wisdom is yeah. if you're offered money, accept it, but then vote according to your conscience. They actually told them, take your money and shove it. That is how convicted they are that this is not the right cause for them. Obviously, some people did vote for APC, but it's just really good to see that money can't buy everything in this country anymore. But this is just, you know, vote buying continues to rear its ugly head in our political system. Every single election, those allegations are there. And it's an electoral offense. So I think until an example is made of people, like with stern jail time, it's going to continue. No, well, I don't know what type of uh, jail term. I mean, look at the presiding supervising officer who took that ballot box away. I mean, what is happening here, uh, Rufai? I mean, it's sad. But you know, the problem with Nigeria is the fact that we see these things. We set up committees to solve those problems. The committees will do reports. We wouldn't take the reports. We wouldn't take the recommendations of those reports. We've had committees been set up to look into electoral malpractice. There was a waste report that came out. It was said that we should have an independent body that will look at cases like this, vote by electoral offenses in general. Till date, everything is still lumped together with INEC. And INEC cannot do everything, can't, can't conduct elections in the first place, can't ensure that the BVAS works, and still ensure prosecution for electoral offenses. The report is sitting there gathering dust over the years. That report came out after the elections that brought President Umar Musa Aradu of blessed memories. And he came out to say the elections that brought me in were fraught with irregularities. The waste report was set on, nothing has been done. So we'll constantly see this unless we fix the problems we have on ground. Yes, we can say vote buying and everything. But how about appropriate bodies to prosecute them? Are they adequate? Secondly, it goes to show that we are still transiting the, the process of political maturity. The fact that opinions and ideologies and projects and manifestos don't count. It is about people bribing people and electoral officers snatching ballot boxes and all sorts of claims and counterclaims like it happened in Urumba North that is still heralding our politics and that's a big problem. Thirdly, it shows that INEC needs to go back and stop being bullish and take lessons. Because the same beavers that Aina came to in a sort of braggadocious manner says is the solution to all our problems, we had challenges with beavers that day. I know those are teaching problems, but yes, in taking feedbacks, don't be braggadocious. Go back and see how we can you know, impact it. But most importantly, for me, the biggest winners are their number of people. I saw the resolve of the evil people to stand tall, even if the fact that there was a lot of voter apathy, people didn't come out to vote. I checked out the stats. <clears throat> For every polling unit, it was about 10 to 15 percent of the registered voters that came out to vote, and which is very sad. That's quite low. That shows you that a lot of people did not come out to vote. And that's why you're seeing the meager numbers. The, just one local government left. Soludo is leading with meager over 100,000 votes. The next person, over 50,000 votes. Those are very small numbers. So we should encourage more people to vote. But the fact that it was safe, secure, peaceful, I'm happy about that. I must congratulate India Nambra. India Nambra, Dr. Yes. Abati. Okay, first, politics in Nigeria is heavily monetized. Whether you are a candidate or you are involved at any particular level. Although there are rules on campaign finance, I don't think anybody observes that. After the 2020, uh, 2019 general election, INEC was, you know, uh, chasing political parties around the place to respect what the law says in terms of making returns with regard to campaign finance. Because the bulk of the money is spent, politicians will claim, you know, mobilizing the people. And you probably will not have receipts for that. But the example that we had in Anambra, whereby you had a group of women who refused to collect money, I think that that's an interesting development. I think it's the kind of development that we'd like to see in more places. But the only way you can get that 
can be for a number of reasons. One, if the people themselves have a stake in what is going on. If you go, for example, I guess, to Sofia, Sofia that uh, Charles Soludo's uh, uh, you know, uh, territory, and uh, you want to give his own uh, kinsmen, you know, his own uh, people uh, money, they are likely to say no. Perhaps if you go somewhere else, they probably will collect the money. But the pattern we'd like to see will be the people rejecting uh, monetary inducement for them to, to vote. You know, that way, if they re refuse it, then they can make an informed choice. They can exercise their right to vote in a free manner without anybody uh, trying to force them in any particular direction. Two, yes, the point about vote buying is an electoral offense, yes, and the laws are there. But recently we had Dr. Festus Okoye, uh, who is uh, the director in charge of voter mobilization, education, and all of that. And he said, look, INEC does not have the capacity to enforce those laws. So who does that? And that is why I think that, you know, the point is relevant about setting up an electoral offenses commission tribunal, which was one of the outcomes of the Ways uh, Commission and one of the many recommendations of persons in civil society. And the whole idea is that when persons are even apprehended, nobody f follows up. How many electoral offenders have you had uh, being sanctioned? Uh, every election we have these electoral offenses, but it's very rare for you to say so, so number of persons have been sanctioned. Perhaps if there is a dedicated tribunal, uh, the will of justice would uh, move faster and uh, quite a number of persons uh, can be uh, taken to uh, task. Now, again, in Anambra, yes, the voter turnout was poor, but even the uh, few people that came out, we saw that determination to make a difference. And we're hoping that tomorrow, uh, when we have the supplementary polls in Iyala, that more people will come out. Having seen now that their initial fears about uh, you know, violence and uh, insecurity uh, is something that has been uh, addressed uh, by the security agencies. And of course, the security agencies themselves should not drop the ball so that we don't have a situation whereby the supplementary poll now becomes a theater, an occasion, Absolutely. an avenue uh, for drilling whatever may have been achieved so far. Well said. Well, in the meantime, Charles Chukuma Soludo has been trending on social media after the Independent National Electoral Commission declared that he won 17 of the 19 local government areas in Anambra State. In the event that Soludo wins the Anambra governorship election, he would be the second central bank governor in Nigeria's history to also become a governor of a state. The first was Clement Isong, a former governor of Cross River State. Isong was a CBN governor from 1967 to 1975 and Cross River State's governor from 1979 to 1983. Well, his image is on the right side of the 1000 Naira note. Well, I wanted to also share this video of Soludo jubilating with his supporters at his residence on Sunday night. Let's take a look. his father you yes. said i mean yeah. i love that video i wanted to just share it one more time it was so heartwarming yeah. to see and i also wanted to share that fun fact with the fact that he will be the second cbn governor if he were to become uh, the next anambra state yes. governor i mean I'm, I'm so excited that his father was there to see that moment of joy you know his father's been through a lot even with him being in politics let's not forget his father was kidnapped a couple of years ago you know, was politically motivated and the likes. But, you know, during that similarity between and Clement Isson, I think, you know, Clement Isson was a towering figure. And I, and I, and I, I have great expectations that Soludo will be able to meet that. Let's not forget that the old Cross River State, Clement Isson pretty much opened up the state with a lot of infrastructural investment. You know, it was under Clement Isson they had the brewery that churned out uh, champion beer, you know, out of, uh, uh, what's it called now, uh, Uyo. You know, it was under Clement Isson that they had a lot of developmental strides in the state, and he pretty much opened up the old Cross River State before it was now broken up into Aquaibom State and the Cross River State as it is today. Uh, he had that prowess, you know, that finesse, and, and, and he was a man that was backed up by his convictions. You know, even as a CBN governor, he was very forthright when it was his time. 
let's not forget he was the one that, that famously said the words that uh, Nigeria has a lot of foreign reserves, but they were not, were not plowing it into investment. And under him, the economy did take up. There was a lot of possibilities in the economy. So I hope that uh, Soludo will follow in the full steps of, you know, his, uh, the, the man before him, Clement Isol, to also open up the state for infrastructural investment. Because once that credit comes into a state, capital investment comes into a state, then the possibilities are endless. Then you can increase your GNI numbers, you can increase all the, uh, the and you can reduce the unemployment numbers and get all the social you know, mobility going on in the state. And then people can have more jobs and you can provide more for education and all of that. So it, it's a great one for, for Solido. Great full steps to follow. Clement is on, has led the way on this. I understand you did very well as a CBN governor. Um, so Ludo, yeah, that he is. did. I thought that was a really lovely video, and yeah. I enjoyed the one shared earlier in this um, show on a previous segment by our colleague Obeteme yeah. George with the little children praying yeah. for him. I thought that was so beautiful. <laughs> and yeah, obviously he's in a really comfortable lead, but as I was saying in another segment of the show earlier, I find it very triggering when results are being announced and they're suddenly Pause. For whatever reason, you know, I have PTSD, yeah. darling. Yeah, so I'm like, just get the show on the road and let's just wrap this up. It's stressful for me. So I can imagine how his supporters are yeah. feeling. I'm sure he's fine, he's comfortable because he'll remember when your piano also went through this exact same thing mm -hmm. and was he emerged triumphant, even though his own election was inconclusive and everything was okay in the end. But I'm sorry, between now and tomorrow, it's going to be a very long, what, 24 to 48 hours. Let's just have this election called, yes. and let's know where we're all going. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Martin. Well, I see that everyone is celebrating, or it's uh, focusing on the fact that uh, our Professor Charles Soludo is in the comfortable lead. But as I was saying yesterday on another program, okay. uh, let all hold our fire, you know, mm -hmm. let us all hold our fire until, uh, you know, INEC officially pronounces him the governor. But from what we have seen, uh, he's done very well, comfortable lead. And even what is more interesting is that in some of the strongholds of some political heavyweights in Anambra State, like Anaucha, where I think uh, Mr. Peter will be comes from, and even uh, Urumba, Urumba South, where Dr. Cosmas Maduka comes from, you know, Soludo led there. And he also led in the battleground, uh, you know, local government area of Aguata local government area, where the three leading candidates is good self, the candidate of the PDP and the candidate of the uh, APC, they come from the same local government. He led with, uh, you know, a very substantial margin. Well, except anything happens, uh, we expect that, you know, from the figures so far, from the 20 local governments, uh, he will probably be declared a winner. And he has his job cut out for him. It, yes, track records are important, but people change. It was CBN governor. But this is a different ballgame. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about monetary policies. This is about leadership. Right. This is about management. This is about meeting up with the expectations of the people. He had uh, a very robust uh, manifesto and he participated in the uh, debate that was organized by Arise News. And there are specific issues, you know, that anybody who is the next governor will have to deal with. Something has to be done about roads infrastructure. Something has Absolutely. to be done about the talent generated revenue. The challenge of unemployment has to be addressed. Whoever is there, you know, has to sustain what, you know, Anambra State has been able to achieve in terms of uh, fiscal, uh, you know, uh, transparency or fiscal consolidation, particularly with regard to capital investment and making sure that, you know, uh, the debt burden uh, in that state is uh, reduced. These are issues that I'm sure, you know, the eventual winner, if it is uh, Professor Soludo, will be familiar with. And then, of course, the big elephant in the room, security. This was a question we asked, you know, each of the uh, three gubernatorial candidates that we engaged with uh, when we had that debate. And you may say, oh, chief security officer uh, has no powers uh, within the purview of the Constitution. But what we have also seen in other places is that, yes, a governor who is focused, you know, will have uh, a lot to do. And we hope that, uh, you know, if uh, Soludo is declared uh, the winner eventually, as you all expect, that he will also carry along the other contestants in that race. Well, this will not a be a, a question of saying, uh, you, you don't have a school certificate result. <laughs> uh, you, uh, what were you doing before? No. 
He will, he should, we expect that if he emerges, he should be governor of all, he should carry everybody along with him, and he should, uh, you know, demonstrate uh, a high dose of emotional intelligence, because that will help, uh, because of the divisions uh, within the state. Right. But we'll be here waiting for INEC uh, to congratulate uh, the declared winner. All right. Well, so I wait. Go the spoils. <laughs> I'm, we'll carry along a point. I'm trying to remember one election where that happened. All right. Well, in terms of uh, leading everybody, you can't be a, a leader of uh, 17 or 18 local governments. You have to be leader of all. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, away from Anambra. And Dr. Abati, you did very well with your pronunciation of the evil, <laughs> evil local government area. Thumbs up to you. <laughs> yes. matter, yeah, but still. Right <laughs> we'll take our final story in the United States. Dr. Samuel Emanuel, the Houston physician who gained national attention last year for pushing hydroxychloroquine as a cure for COVID-19, is in the news again. Well, according to the Houston Chronicle, the Texas Medical Board on October 15th took a corrective action against the physician after she prescribed to treat a patient's COVID-19 infection without adequately explaining the health consequences. The medical board ordered Emmanuel to submit proof of informed consent or permission given by a patient who understands the possible health outcomes and was also ordered to pay $500 to the medical board. Well, Dr. Emmanuel, who was licensed by the Texas Medical Board in 2019 for pediatrics and emergency medicine, was born in Cameroon. She graduated in 1990 from the University of Calabar in Nigeria and completed a residency at the Bronx Hospital in New York. You know I'm coming to you, Dr. Abati, on this story. <laughs> Your no, she's not a Malabar. She's a Malabar. Oh, Malabar. 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 When she started going on and on about how hydroxychloroquine is, uh, you know, uh, a solution, and she joined on one occasion uh, some other doctors uh, who said that hydroxychloroquine uh, was a cure for COVID-19, <laughs> even when, you know, other scientists had made it clear that no cure had been found. Now <laughs> there are also other, you know. Uh, persons, politicians prescribing solutions, yeah. either chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, all of that had been shown uh, not to be the, uh, the, the drug or the solution. But in her own case, there's uh, another side to it. She's also some kind of evangelical person, mm -hmm. you know, who talks mm -hmm. about spiritism. Mm -hmm. uh, she runs a group called Firepower. Uh, ministries. She talks about spirit husbands, spirit spouses, space aliens. So you really don't know. <laughs> you really don't know where to draw the line between our spirituality and science. And yeah. it's good that the uh, Texas Medical Board, you know, has uh, tried to uh, sanction her, uh, you know, yeah, and ask her relevant way. questions. Well, thank you all. That's all I have on what's trending today. Thank I'll you, Ojinika. Tomorrow.